Chapter One of Some Articles About Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. Some Articles About Mark Twain. Chapter One Samuel Langhorne Clemens by Charles H. Clark. Samuel Langhorne Clemens of Hartford, Connecticut is known all over the world as Mark Twain. His books have been translated into all the modern languages, and his name has become a household word wherever people read. He first acquired fame by his inimitable and irresistible humor, but the position which he has taken is due not merely to his success as a humorist, but to the genius of the man as displayed in various directions. He has taken a leading place in literature, in society, and in business in America, and his career is a most suggestive illustration of how the natural gifts of a man can conquer obstacles that seem impossible. At the age of twelve years he was a penniless, unschooled orphan. At twenty, an illiterate pilot on the Mississippi, and even at thirty he was entirely unknown and had written very little, while at thirty-five he was famous, and now, past fifty, a gentleman of culture, each year adds to his fame and strengthens his position. His was no accidental success, for if so, his light would have long ago gone out. On the contrary, his wit is as keen, his humor as fresh, his satire as sharp, and his imagination as fantastic as when people first realized the power of these gifts that he possesses. He was born in the little town of Florida in Monroe County, Missouri, November 30, 1835. His father died in 1847, and the boy had thereafter to support himself. His first work was as a printer, and though he changed his occupation in a short time, this beginning was no doubt influential in subsequently turning his mind to literary work, as it has been with so many others. At seventeen he decided to follow the Mississippi River as a pilot, and he learned the channel for 1,375 miles from St. Louis to New Orleans. Many of his books reflect his observations and experiences there, noticeably The Life on the Mississippi, 1883, and it was from his life there that he took his pseudonym of Mark Twain, which is a call relating to the sounding for the depth of water. From the Mississippi he went to Nevada as private secretary for his elder brother, who had been appointed lieutenant governor of the territory. There he drifted into mining and shared the experience of the many who make it a failure and are not heard of, not of the few who make great fortunes. In 1862 he was offered the place of local editor of the Virginia City Enterprise, to which he had occasionally contributed. He first used his signature of Mark Twain upon that journal. In 1864 he went to San Francisco, still in newspaper work, and wrote there occasional sketches which had in them the elements of popularity. In 1866 he made a trip as a correspondent to the Sandwich Islands, and when he returned he lectured in Nevada and California. His career so far abounded in variety, but could hardly be called successful, and gave but the slightest promise of what the next few years would reveal. In the spring of 1867 he went to New York and published there his first volume, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras, and other sketches. This sold well, both at home and in England. The choice humor of the Jumping Frog story was at once appreciated, and the reputation of the author was established. In that same year, 1867, Mark Twain sailed on the steamer Quaker City on her journey to the Holy Land, which journey is now famous because he made it. In his Innocents Abroad, 
he described the sights, experiences, emotions, and characters of that singular and interesting trip. It is one of the most widely read of all American books, and deserves to be. There is nothing like it except one or two of his later books, and they are not like it through any repetition. It is a remarkable book in many ways. Its humor is simply irrepressible, and cannot be put down. The reader may try to resist it, and may even at first rule it out of order, but you have to surrender to it, and you laugh as you surrender. And yet, funny as it is, it is also one of the most admirable descriptive works of travel that has been written. People journeying over the same ground, or seeking information as to any of the places mentioned, find it very useful to consult for practical purposes. It has had an immense sale, and has been translated and printed in many languages. Roughing It, 1871, and A Tramp Abroad, 1880, are of the same character in many respects, but each has its individuality, while they all have the individuality of the author stamped upon them. Mark Twain's list of publications includes Beside the Jumping Frog, Innocents Abroad, Roughing It, and A Tramp Abroad, which have already been alluded to, The Gilded Age, By Himself and Charles Dudley Warner, 1873, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876, Sketches, 1877, The Prince and the Pauper, 1881, The Stolen White Elephant, 1883, Life on the Mississippi, 1883, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1885, and A Library of Humor, 1888. This last is a compilation of the characteristic works of American humorists in which all classes of such writers are included, both the dead and the living. It is a large volume, and as the first is so large it may be followed by others of a similar nature. A deal of reading and selecting was necessary in the preparation of the volume, which, though only now published, was in great measure ready five years ago. Mark Twain was aided in preparing it, so the writer understands, by Mr. W. D. Howells. The story of the Gilded Age developed the unique character of Colonel Sellers, unique in letters but familiar in daily life, and the play of Colonel Sellers, based on the story, was worked out by Mark Twain, and proved as great a success as his stories. Already more than half a million, probably six hundred or seven hundred thousand, of Mark Twain's books have been sold in this country. England and her colonies have taken half as many more, and the larger works have been translated into German, French, Italian, Norwegian, Danish, etc., his name is known all over the world. In personal appearance he is of slender figure, with a very noticeable face and head. His gray hair is thick and curling, and his very heavy eyebrows arch over keen gray eyes. In conversation he has a somewhat slow and deliberate manner of speech, but his talk of the moment among his friends sparkles with the same irrepressible humor that marks his writings. Some men, when they acquire the fame that Mark Twain secured for himself, which came, no doubt, to his own surprise, proceed to write themselves out as rapidly as possible. They empty their wells and dry up. It is a proof of the size of his mind that he fell into no such error. He was equal to his opportunity, and aware of his perils, and, as soon as he saw the world was ready to listen to him, he proceeded to make himself more worthy to be heard. For years he has been a conscientious and untiring student of language, literature, history, etc., not merely making up for deficiencies of early education, but laying solid foundations and building on them a broad and liberal culture which has made him a man of letters in the true sense of the term. His thorough knowledge of English and American literature is supplemented by a knowledge of that of various other languages 
of which he has acquired a thorough command. The story of the Prince and the Pauper, for instance, reveals somewhat the extent and fidelity of his study of early England, and is a story that, at the beginning of his career, he could neither have thought out or appreciated, and yet it is very distinctively marked with his peculiar mark. The singular and varied experiences of his life, however unfortunate many have seemed at the time, have proved his good fortune in giving him a remarkably wide opportunity for the study of human nature. In 1871 Mr. Clemens and his family made Hartford their home. He built a novel and interesting brick house which is next door on one side to the home of Charles Dudley Warner and on the other side to that of Harriet Beecher Stowe. These three famous Hartford writers, none of whom is a native of the city, have for years lived within the sound of each other's voices in what is known as Nook Farm, a part of the city that was once remote and secluded although houses have now sprung up all about it. Mr. Clemens' home is seldom without a guest, and life there comprehends a large measure of what is most enjoyable. His books have brought him in a princely income, and he has shown extraordinary good sense in other business affairs. In the New York publishing house of C. L. Webster and Company, which brought out General Grant's memoirs, he is a partner and the guiding spirit, and its publications have been phenomenally successful. He has also gone into other outside operations. Many an author would be satisfied with the profits he has made upon Mark Twain's scrapbook, a work with nothing in it, which is one of its advantages over many other books that have been printed. This scrapbook he invented because he had never found what he wanted. More than one hundred thousand have been sold. Mark Twain is an inveterate smoker, a master at bicycle riding, a good whist player, and the holder of the champion cue at billiards among his friends. He has a billiard room in his house where every Friday night he reasserts his supremacy. He is a reader of the finest discriminative faculty, high dramatic power, and remarkable sympathetic interpretation, and his reading of Browning, whom he greatly admires, is a choice entertainment. He is a prominent member of the literary circle in Hartford, known as the Monday Evening Club, to which belong, or have belonged, such men as the late Dr. Horace Bushnell, and the late Dr. N. J. Burton, and also Dr. J. Hammond Trumbull, Charles Dudley Warner, Senator Joseph R. Hawley, President George Williamson Smith of Trinity College, the Rev. Joseph H. Twitchell, the Rev. Dr. Parker, and others, an active membership in all of twenty persons. He has made himself an important factor in the local and literary life of the city, and is one of the most popular as well as most famous citizens of Hartford. End of chapter 1 Samuel Langhorn Clemens Read by John Greenman Chapter 2 of Some Articles About Mark Twain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Mark Twain at Home From The London World, a Society Weekly the London World, in a series of pen portraits of celebrities at home, devoted a paper to Mark Twain at Hartford, giving a pleasant sketch of the characteristics of the great American humorist. It says, Among those American authors who, because they have had the courage to cut loose from the apron strings of England, have achieved the greatest success both at home and abroad, Mark Twain is, in point of popularity, facile princeps. Those who only know him as the author of The Innocents Abroad and Roughing It are apt to imagine he is a kind of frontier joker, of the type with which Bret Hart has made us familiar. It may be that there is even yet a vague suspicion of this bent, although his external person certainly shows no trace of it, 
if you see him in his charming home at hartford in the valley of the connecticut surrounded with every object which taste and wealth can procure you feel that such a connection has been erroneous the mansion with its quaint old english architecture and its exquisite tiles and mosaics the rich ferneries and half tropical hothouses are no mere extraneous accumulations such as any man of wealth might create but a gradual and organic outgrowth of the owner's mind which gives you a delightful peep into the inner recesses of his character the main building as well as the stables is built of dark red brick with dark brown trimmings interspersed with inlaid devices of scarlet painted brick and black greek patterns in mosaic the whole has a most novel and pleasing effect nothing gaudy and glaring but all arranged with a rare artistic taste and a strict regard for harmony in colors and outlines during the summer the outer window-sills are draped with hanging ferns and bright nasturtiums and the woodwork of the broad east indian portico is half concealed beneath the foliage of clambering vines but as winter reigns supreme during a good many months of the year in new england mark twain has taken care to provide himself with summer vistas even while nature does not afford them his library the place where the owner is most frequently to be found opens into a miniature greenhouse full of tall graceful ferns and blooming tropical plants in the midst of all these luxuriant exotics a fountain is constantly playing shedding its spray over the smooth white rocks at its base in the pleasant city of hartford he has gathered about him a delightful circle of friends authors business men and lawyers to whom his hospitable doors are always open and he is indeed the prince of entertainers sitting in his richly furnished library to whose beauty and artistic completeness half the lands of europe have contributed he will tell an anecdote or discuss a literary or social question with a calm directness and earnestness revealing to you an entirely new side of his character that has nothing in common with that which he is wont to display to the public who throng to his lectures even his drollest stories he relates with this same earnest impressiveness and with a face as serious as a sexton's his brilliancy has a certain delightful quality which is almost too evanescent to be imprisoned in any one phrase you have no oppressive consciousness that you are expected to laugh you rather feel as if the talker had unexpectedly taken you into his confidence and you feel your heart going out toward him in return throughout his house mark twain has indulged liberally his taste for wood tints and quaint carvings each of the doors in the library is surmounted with carved cherubs and other biblical and mythical figures spoils from some european pilgrimage in his study on the second floor he revels in sphinxes and griffins whose reclining bodies and capacious wings fashion themselves into luxurious lounges easy chairs and sofas the mantelpiece with all its magnificent superstructure had once adorned an old english or scottish country seat and mark twain was fortunate enough to pick it up during one of his many sojourns in england amid these surroundings mark twain spends the time between breakfast and dinner composing with much serious reflection the sketches novels and dramas which have shaken the american public with laughter after dinner the chances are that you will find him tranquilly smoking a cigar before the fire in the library and chatting leisurely with some friend who addresses him plainly as mark as his nom de plume somehow persists in clinging to him both in his private and public relations his rich and varied experiences in the past as a western editor 
gold digger and pilot on the mississippi have stored his brain with abundant material for future works which have still to be written mark twain is a man of middle height solidly built but not stout his features are all of a clear massive modeling and the prevailing expression seems to be resolute courage and determination his upper lip is covered with a thick brown mustache and the broad territory of his forehead is usually encroached upon by his brown curly hair his eyes are small and keen but are by no means lacking in kindliness and humor in his whole bearing there is a frank cordiality which is very winning his fine library and his easy conversation testify to the excellence of his literary taste mark twain is a devoted admirer of macaulay and has a habit of ever returning to him when the lighter literary pablum of the day begins to pall upon his sense the much abused term professional humorist can hardly apply to mark twain he is rather a constitutional humorist because his mind is so fashioned that in dealing with any subject whatever the humorist point of view first and most naturally presents itself to him for all that he is very careful not to rush into publicity with a half-formed or half-perfected thought his after-dinner speeches which are probably read by a larger number of men and women in america than any public document the president's message not accepted would no doubt have been very good and very laughable even if they had been entirely impromptu but the careful and critical revision to which he subjects them before their public appearance certainly refines their quality when mark twain is not writing or making speeches he smokes and if he feels any further need of recreation he takes it in playing billiards in the third story of his house there is an elegantly appointed billiard-room where he often spends an evening with three or four masculine friends though he keeps handsome horses housing them in a superb stable and may be seen daily driving through the city with a fine pair of bays he is not much of a connoisseur of horseflesh or a sportsman in politics he at first impresses you as an indifferentist with perhaps a leaning toward pessimism but if you happen to touch certain chords which never fail to respond in an american bosom you soon discover that your first impression was very remote from the truth the fact is like many another thoughtful man mark twain sees plainly the gravity of the present and future in the united states and accordingly has very little patience with the spread egoism and cheap declamations of contending politicians probably his political creed is not very different from that of the independents a party which is daily growing among This is chapter three of Some Articles About Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three Youth of Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Mrs. Sarah K. Bolton, in her capital volume on famous American authors, gives some interesting items on Mr. Clemens' early manhood when young clemens was twelve years old the upright and manly father died leaving the household without means as he had lost all by endorsing for friends he was one of a fine virginia family several of whom had been in congress and he was also a man of brain and force of character the mother was a warm-hearted woman kind to every living creature with great emotional depths and unusual felicity in her choice of words either in speaking or writing left with four children they must needs do their part in the struggle for support 
Samuel went to school ostensibly, where, he says, he excelled only in spelling, but loved to spend much of his time upon the river, and so successful was he in getting into the turbid waters that he was dragged out of it nine times before he was fifteen. Evidently it was not his fate to die by drowning. In these early years he tried various methods of earning a livelihood, and finally learned printing in the office of the Hannibal Courier, of which he says in his book of sketches that it had five hundred subscribers, and they paid in cordwood, cabbages, and unmarketable turnips. With a desire to see himself in print, his first articles appeared during a week's absence of the editor. So personal were they that the town was stirred, and the paper was in jeopardy. However, it resulted in thirty-three new subscribers, all of whom wished to read what was written about their neighbors, and the journal had the vegetables to show for it, cordwood, cabbages, beans, and unsaleable turnips enough to run the family for two years. After he had been nearly three years on the paper, he made up his mind to run away and see the exposition in New York. He had been earning fifty cents a week, and had saved the necessary funds. Arriving in New York, he had twelve dollars in his pocket, a ten-dollar bill of which sum he had sewed into his coat-sleeve. When the exposition had been duly examined, he found work in John N. Green's printing office. But after two or three months he met a man from his own town, Hannibal, and fearing that his whereabouts would be reported, he suddenly took his departure for Philadelphia, working on the ledger and elsewhere. While here, from taking the part of a poor boy who was imposed upon by a fireman, he was severely beaten by the latter, so that he resembled Lisbon after the earthquake, he says. Finally he made up his mind that he had experienced enough of the eastern world, and, with his ten dollars still sewed into coat-sleeve, went back to his Missouri home. All these years he and his boy friends had cherished, as he says in Old Times on the Mississippi, published in the Atlantic Monthly for 1875, an ambition to be a steamboat man. We had transient ambitions of other sorts, but they were only transient. When a circus came and went, it left us all burning to become circus clowns. The first negro minstrel show that came to our section left us all suffering to try that kind of life. Now and then we had a hope that, if we lived and were good, God would permit us to be pirates. These ambitions faded out, each in its turn, but the ambition to be a steamboat man always remained. I first wanted to be a cabin boy, so that I could come out with a white apron on and shake a tablecloth over the side where all my old comrades could see me. Later I thought I would rather be a deckhand, who stood on the end of the stage plank with a coil of rope in his hand, because he was particularly conspicuous. But these were only daydreams. They were too heavenly to be contemplated as real possibilities. By and by I ran away. I said I never would come home again till I was a pilot and could come in glory. But somehow I could not manage it. I went meekly aboard a few boats that lay packed together like sardines at the long St. Louis wharf, and very humbly inquired for the pilots but got only a cold shoulder and short words from mates and clerks. But I was ashamed to go home. I was in Cincinnati, and I set to work to map out a new career. I had been reading about the recent explorations of the river Amazon by an expedition sent out by our government. It was said that the expedition, owing to difficulties, had not thoroughly explored a part of the country lying about the headwaters some 
four thousand miles from the mouth of the river. It was only about fifteen hundred miles from Cincinnati to New Orleans, where I could doubtless get a ship. I had thirty dollars left. I would go on and complete the exploration of the Amazon. I packed my valise and took passage on an ancient tub called the Paul Jones for New Orleans. For the sum of sixteen dollars I had the scarred and tarnished splendors of her main saloon, principally to myself, for she was not a creature to attract the eye of wiser travelers. When we presently got under way and went poking down the broad Ohio, I became a new being and the subject of my own admiration. I was a traveler. A word had never tasted so good in my mouth before. I kept my hat off all the time, and stayed where the wind and the sun could strike me, because I wanted to get a bronzed and weather-beaten look of an old traveler. Before the second day was half gone, I experienced a joy which filled me with the purest gratitude, for I saw that the skin had begun to blister and peel off my neck and face. I wished that the boys and girls at home could see me now. After two weeks the Paul Jones reached New Orleans, and the young traveler discovered two things. One was that a vessel would not be likely to sail for the mouth of the Amazon under ten or twelve years, and the other was that the nine or ten dollars still left in my pocket would not suffice for so imposing an exploration as I had planned, even if I could afford to wait for a ship. Therefore it followed that I must contrive a new career. The Paul Jones was now bound for St. Louis. I planned a siege against my pilot, and at the end of three hard days he surrendered. He agreed to teach me the Mississippi River from New Orleans to St. Louis for five hundred dollars, payable out of the first wages I should receive after graduating. I entered upon the small enterprise of learning twelve or thirteen hundred miles of the great Mississippi River with the easy confidence of my time of life. If I had really known what I was about to require of my faculties, I should not have had the courage to begin. The work proved hard and discouraging for the youth but he finally reached the desired position of pilot and had the proud satisfaction of receiving two hundred and fifty dollars per month. Here he remained for five years, till he was twenty-six, when the growth of railroads and the Chapter 4 of Some Articles About Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some Articles About Mark Twain. Chapter 4 Mark Twain Gossip by Will M. Clemens. No relation. Read by John Greenman. Will M. Clemens, in Famous Funny Fellows, a series of bright sketches of prominent American humorists, says of Mark Twain, In 1868 Mr. Clemens formed one of a party who sailed in the steamship Quaker City for an extended excursion to Palestine and the Holy Land. He went in the capacity of a newspaper correspondent as well as for pleasure, and wrote interesting letters while abroad to the California papers. Returning to America, he gathered his letters together and rewrote them in book form, which he called Innocence Abroad, or The New Pilgrim's Progress. The work was very funny, yet, notwithstanding the rollicking satire and laugh-provoking character of the book, the author met with the greatest difficulty in getting it published. 
he sent his manuscript to the leading publishers of new york boston and philadelphia and they all refused it mark's literary vanity was sorely wounded and he was about determined to throw his book into the fire when a literary friend albert d richardson now deceased to whom he handed the manuscript pronounced it very clever and offered to take it with him to hartford connecticut where was located the american publishing company a firm that had issued several books for richardson after much talk and discussion among the directors of the publishing company the book was finally issued its success was extraordinary and since its publication over two hundred thousand copies of the book have been sold the publishing company cleared seventy five thousand dollars by the venture in eighteen sixty nine twain tried journalism for a time in buffalo where he held an editorial position on a daily paper while there he fell in love with a young lady a sister of dan made famous in innocents abroad but her father a gentleman of wealth and position looked unfavorably upon his daughter's alliance with a bohemian literary character i like you he said to mark but what do i know of your antecedents who is there to answer for you anyhow after reflecting a few moments mark thought some of his old california friends would speak a good word for him the prospective father-in-law wrote letters of inquiry to several residents of san francisco to whom clemens referred him and with one exception the letters denounced him bitterly especially deriding his capacity for becoming a good husband mark sat beside his fiancee when the letters were read aloud by the old gentleman there was a dreadful silence for a moment and then mark stammered well that's pretty rough on a fellow anyhow his betrothed came to the rescue however and overturned the mass of testimony against him by saying i'll risk you anyhow the terrible father-in-law lived in elmira new york and there mark was married he had told his friends in the newspaper office at buffalo to select him a suite of rooms in a first-class boarding-house in the city and to have a carriage at the depot to meet the bride and groom mark knew they would do it and gave himself no more anxiety about it when he reached buffalo he found a handsome carriage a beautiful span of horses and a driver in livery they drove him up to a handsome house on an aristocratic street and as the door was opened there were the parents of the bride to welcome them home the old folks had arrived on the quiet by a special train after mark had gone through the house and examined its elegant finishings he was notified officially that he had been driven by his own coachman in his own carriage to his own house they say tears came to his wonderfully dark and piercing eyes and that all he could say was well this is a first-class swindle not long after his marriage mark settled down in hartford and invested capital in insurance companies there his second book roughing it appeared in eighteen seventy one and had almost as large a sale as its predecessor he visited england a few months later and arranged for the publication of his works there in four volumes on his return he issued his third book in partnership with charles dudley warner which was styled the gilded age this was followed by the adventures of tom sawyer a book for boys in eighteen seventy six these books all commanded an immense sale and several editions have been exhausted the american publishing company of hartford represented these works in this country chatto and windus published them in england and mark's continental publisher was tauschnitz of leipzig among his other accomplishments clemens is a politician and has done good service on the stump for the republican party for all this he is the proud possessor of the title of honorable many of the most ludicrous scenes in the works of mark twain are taken from life 
the steamboat scene in the adventures of colonel sellers was witnessed by him when a young man his adventure with a dead man was in his father's office in missouri his description of the horror creeping over him as he saw a ghastly hand lying in the moonlight how he tried to shut his eyes and tried to count and opened them in time to see the dead man lying on the floor stiff and stark with a ghastly wound in his side and lastly how he beat a terrified retreat through the window carrying the sash with him is vividly remembered by every reader of the gilded age the whole thing occurred just as mark recorded it the man was killed in a street fight almost in front of mr clemens door was taken in there while a post-mortem examination was held and there left until the next morning during the night mark came in and the scene described was enacted a writer in the san francisco chronicle wrote not many years since as follows there have been moments in the lives of various kind-hearted and respectable citizens of california and nevada when if mark twain were up before them as members of a vigilance committee for any mild crime such as mule stealing or arson it is to be feared his shrift would have been short what a dramatic picture the idea conjures up to be sure mark before those honest men infuriated by his practical jokes trying to show them what an innocent creature he was when it came to mules or how the only policy of fire insurance he held had lapsed how void of guile he was in any direction and all with that inimitable drawl that perplexed countenance and the peculiar scraping back of the left foot like a boy speaking his first piece at school it is but fair to say that the fun that mark mixed up for citizens in those days was not altogether appreciated in the midst of it for some one touched too sharply surge bat amari aliquid and mark had another denouncer joined to the wounded throng he is keenly sensitive to sympathy or criticism and relates as one of the most harrowing experiences of his life a six hours ride across england his fellow traveller an englishman who shortly after they started drew forth the first volume of the english edition of innocents abroad from his pocket and calmly perused it from beginning to end without a smile then he drew forth the second volume and read it as solemnly as the first mark says he thought he should die yet john bull was probably enjoying it after his own undemonstrative style in another instance the same writer says of mark twain this literary wag has performed some services which entitled him to the gratitude of his generation he has run the traditional sunday school book boy through his literary mangle and turned him out washed and ironed into a proper state of flatness and collapse that whining canting early dying anemic creature was the nauseating model held up to the full-blooded mischievous lads of bygone years as worthy their imitation he poured his religious hypocrisy over every honest pleasure a boy had he whined his lachrymose warnings on every playground he vexed their lives so when mark grew old enough he went gunning for him and lo wherever his soul may be the skin of the strumous young pietist is now neatly tacked up to view on the sunday school door of to-day as a warning and the lads of to-day see no particular charm in a priggish hydropathical existence End of chapter four marked